Good morning, good morning. How we doing, church? We are all in communication because not one person answered. We doing okay, church? Yeah. All right, here we go, here we go, here we go. Hello, everyone online. We are glad that you are joining us this morning. Um, I'm glad you're here. It's fun, even on a gloomy, rainy day, we can still get together and gather um, and lift up the name of our King. That's how we're going to start this morning, is I just want you to get comfortable. Whatever that is to you, if that's sitting down, if that's standing in silence, just be comfortable this morning, church. Father God, we, we thank you. We thank you for another day in your creation. Father God, for giving us breath this morning. For giving us purpose to praise your name. Lord, you are omnipresent, which means you are everywhere. You are in yesterday, you're today, you're tomorrow. You're here in the room. You're with those online. But what we really want to do is within our spirit, we want to invite you to come in and move and to come in and do the things that you want to do. Jesus. Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be. Let us become more aware of 
circumstances in our heart really struggle. Can we just spend the next few moments? Whew. Father God, let's sing the next few moments just remembering his goodness and his truth. So when we continue to sing these lyrics in a moment, we are singing it in a place of declaration and authority. Not just from a place of this is a pretty song. But we are singing it with declaration and authority. Trust what you say That your good Your love is great And I'm broken inside And I give you my
trust what you say that your God, your love is great. And I'm broken inside. I give you my If you have your communion cup, I encourage you to hold it in your hands this morning. These are the ones that open easy, so you don't have to start yet. You know, Revelation 1, we're going to be in that book this morning. It says that Jesus came to free us from our sin. And that's why we do communion. It's just a reminder. Good morning, Tammy. Good morning. Welcome back. It's a reminder to us of what Jesus has done for us, that he gave his life. He willingly gave his life for us. And so when we have communion, it's not a religious thing. It's not something that we just do. It's something that we do to remember what Jesus has done for us. And so I want, what I want is just, can you just take a moment yourself, and can you remember, and those of you watching from home, remember what Jesus has done for you. And maybe it's something that happened a long time ago. Maybe it's something that he's done just recently. But would you remember, take a moment and remember. Before we move on, I want you to take a moment to remember what he's done. Father God, for some of us this morning, it's hard to think about what you've done because we're really busy thinking about what we need you to do right now. But when we pause those thoughts for a moment and we remember ultimately what you've done is you've given your life for us, that you loved us so much that you came. You lived among us. You taught us. You cared for us. You brought healing to us. And you gave your life for us. But you did not stay in the grave. You rose again. Amen. And now you are at the right hand of your Father in heaven, enthroned. Yes, power and glory are yours, Jesus. And you tell us to do this in remembrance of you and what you've done for us. Lord, we take a moment right now and we thank you for those things that you've done for us, all the things that we've thought about this morning. So if you take the bread this morning, Jesus says when you take this, when you eat of it, remember that it's a representation of my, my body that was broken for you. So take the bread. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup and held it up and said, this is my blood, which I willingly pour out for you. And so when you drink it, remember what I've done for you. Remember that we've been set free from our sin, from our hurts, our habits, our hang-ups, we've been set free from all those things in Christ. So take the juice this morning. Lord, we remember this morning the greatness of who you are and what you've done for us. And now, Lord, we present those things that we were thinking about, what we need you to do now. God, we carry these things into our lives, into this room from our lives. We carry these things in. And Lord, there's needs in this room. Lord, we pray that would you meet those needs? God, I'm not going to pray that you'd meet our wants, but God, I pray that you would meet our needs this morning. For those who are at home, Lord, that you would meet them exactly where they are. Lord, we thank you that your promise is that you'll be with us till the end of the age. 
And as we see the end coming, we thank you that you are with us today, right now, in this place. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Why don't we all just stand together? Stand together on our feet. We lift up his names for the next few songs. Christ is my firm foundation.
They'll toll before you You silence the boast of sin and grace The heavens are rolling Praise of your glory For you
Isn't that fun? We're worshiping him with all we are, together as the body of Christ. I love it. Thank you, Jesus, for your truth and your reminders today. Father God, thank you for allowing us to be here to soak in more of you. Lord, continue to work and to speak through Pastor Kevin as he brings the word today. Lord, allow us. Allow us. More of you. Amen. Amen. Take a moment. Greet a neighbor. Say, say hello to somebody new. We're going to continue in just a moment. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? Larry's going to whistle. It's going to be loud. There we go. Thank you. That's effective. I need to learn how to do that. Well, good morning. My name is Marcy. I'm the children and family pastor here, if you don't know me. Um, yeah, let's just get on with it. So our first announcement is prayer and worship night this Thursday at 7 o'clock. <laughs> pastor Kevin's ready. Um, we come here. We do an hour and a half of what you just did, and it's an awesome time. I really encourage you to come. Most RCC people don't come, so let's surprise Pastor Kevin this time and all show up. It's great. (laughs) 
All right, this Saturday coming up, May 11th, is the men's Bible study here at church at 9 o'clock. Are you guys going to be in the modular again? Yes. yes. Out in the modular. Uh, I hear there's coffee and food, and it's a good time. So, guys, if you've been part of that, or even if you haven't, I think you can still come. Okay, that's it. Okay, tithes and offerings. Uh, Carrie's here today. So if you have any questions about tithes and offerings, she's the one that you want to talk to about that. <laughs> she loves being pointed out. Um, no, honestly, thank you for giving. Um, we are blessed here. There's lots of ways. You can see them all. Um, I was trying to think of a good transition from tithes and offerings to the middle school Bible study, but... I couldn't, so I'm just going to dive right in. Um, last fall, I asked you guys to pray for a group of middle schoolers who are going to start the Rooted Bible Study. Um, so we started in October, and it took us five months to do the six-week study. <laughs> but um, there was four of them. They're sitting up here. They didn't want me to point them out. Um, they came every week faithfully and sometimes did their homework, but they always asked questions. They always wanted to dig deeper and they always wanted to know more. And I'm just so proud of them. Um, we were getting close to the end and I was like, Hey guys, we're almost done. And they just looked at me and said, well, what's next? So we, this week started a new Bible study called Forged and it's all about discipleship, and it's written for teenagers, um, and it just covers who, who should I get advice from? Um, what about social media? Uh, things like that that are relevant to them. And this week we talked about um, the vine and the branches and staying connected, and it was really good. We have another uh, fifth grader who joined us um, who goes to a different church, so... It's good. It's growing. It was, a, it was a really good time. So please keep praying for them. Um, I'm excited. They challenge me. Uh, I try to stay one step ahead, but sometimes they leap me, and I, <laughs> I um, have to come back and answer their questions later. So I asked them to do a testimony, because one of the things we covered in Rooted was sharing our faith and how to do that, and actually practicing that, because if you've never done it before... It's really not comfortable, um, so we actually practiced it, and I asked them to write or share testimonies, um, and at first they were all like, absolutely not, we are not doing that, uh, we are not getting up in front of the church, and that's not going to happen. So we talked about different ways that they could do it. So they each kind of chose a different way, three of them. Um, there's two videos and one written testimony who the person was, wishes to remain anonymous. So I've changed some identifying words, and I'm just going to read it. I wanted to grow my faith and relationship with Jesus. Not long after that, Marcy told me she wanted to start a Bible study. I said I would go. A few weeks later, I went to the first meeting. There were three of my friends there, and we had a great time together. I kept going because I really enjoyed it. Months passed, and we were all going. I was learning so much about Jesus and relationships with him. For example, we learned about a group of friends who took their paralyzed friend to Jesus, and he healed him. Every Wednesday, we gathered and ate, and we learned and shared. It seemed to go by so quickly because I was enjoying it so much. The end came. I was sad because it had turned out to be one of the most fun things I've ever done. Near the end, we did a service project. We went and cleaned up somebody's yard. My faith is now so much stronger than I was, and I have a better relationship with Jesus. I learned so much and have so many fun memories. It was amazing. So there's two short videos that we're going to show right now. Ever since I've been baptized, I've been wanting to strengthen my relationship with Jesus. When Marcy invited me to join a Bible study group, I agreed. My expectations were low. I thought it was going to be pretty basic. At the first meeting, 
Three of my friends were there, and we had a good time. The study was slightly more advanced than I thought. Each Wednesday we met there, and I got to learn new things and discuss with my friends. I really enjoyed going, and as we went, I became even closer to God. On the end of the study was a service project, where I could clean somebody's yard. This was supposed to show me the importance of serving in God's kingdom. When I helped clean the yard, I felt my faith strengthen a lot. Cool. As the Bible study came to an end, I realized that I had changed from when I started. Before, I was just listening to stories and lessons in church without giving them that much thought. After, I feel like I understood them deeper. Overall, after going to Bible study, I felt my mindset, the way I viewed everything about him, change. Hi guys. When Mercy first suggested that we start a Bible study group, I was skeptical, but I said sure, because it was just a suggestion. It wasn't actually going to happen, right? And then I got the text. And then I realized it was actually going to happen. And I wasn't so sure about it. I thought it would be just like Sunday school number two. So Marcy gave us our study books and we began. We named our group Flashlight and we would get lessons and we'd read verses and learn about how they apply to our lives. And we were all very open and honest. It was really nice. Now that reads over, I've learned a lot. I've learned to be more comfortable when speaking about Jesus and to just say what's on my mind when speaking about Jesus and be more honest. And I had a lot of fun along the way. I got to go out to the garden and serve, pull out weeds, and we even got to go to Menchie's. So in short, Flashpoint has gotten me rooted in Jesus. Bye. Rooted in Jesus, how awesome is that? Um, I'm very, very proud of you guys. I know for all of you, it was not in your comfort zone, so thank you for stepping out. Um, they have named themselves Flashpoint, and they want to brand it and create T-shirts with a logo, and they're, they're working on that. So um, we haven't announced it yet, but Sunday, Sunday is going to be on June 2nd, and I would really like to use some of that money to get them t-shirts. So if you could support Sunday, Sunday, that would be awesome, and they can all wear their Flashpoint t-shirts. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> nice job. I think they're all leaving. Can we clap for them one more time as they leave? That's cool. Well, good morning. Good morning to those of you tuning online, and glad you're here. Glad you're here with us. You know, what Marcy's doing with our kids is what we're supposed to be doing as a church, and not just as a church, but the church. A lot of times when we think about church, we think about this building. Oh, I'm going to church. I'm going to that nice building. But what we're really saying is, I'm going to go meet with the church. I'm going to go meet with you. I'm going to, we're going to meet together, and we're going to discuss Jesus. And the American church is different because you guys come, and you sometimes it's easy to show up sometimes to church, right? Well, it's not easy to show up, but we do show up. And it's very little participation is needed if we choose that is we can have nice music, and Ashley and Mitch and Alex and Dana can like, wow, that's really nice. And then announcements, and then some guy gets up and talks, or a woman gets up and talks for 45 minutes, and then you go home and you have lunch. But we don't get to discuss. And what The Bible is really clear that we're supposed to get together and chew through the Word of God together. So we're trying to figure out how, how do we do that in our culture yeah, we can have more small groups, and we're, the women have been meeting, the men are meeting right now. It's really a rich time, so I encourage you to be plugged into that. But that's just, once a month isn't enough. I can't eat once a month. I probably should, but I can't, right? And so 
we need to figure out how to do that. Jesus was very clear. The last words before he ascended into heaven was, go and make disciples. And I know we hear that over and over in church. But that's what Jesus told us to do. We're supposed to go and tell people what we know about Jesus. Some of you are brand new in Christ. That's the best disciple maker. Because you know just this much but you can say, hey, put out your hand. I'm going to give you what I have. I know that Jesus came to save me, and he can save you. That's the message they need to hear. And you know what? Then we're just going to walk together. We're going to read our Bibles together. We'll pray together. We'll spend time together. That's making disciples. And so what Pastor Marcy's doing with Flashpoint is a huge deal. So thank you for providing. So she said, I don't have a segue for that, but here's the segue. Because you give... And you invest here in the kingdom of God, Marcy can lead and buy books for kids and lead them. You see the difference that's making in these kids' lives. It's huge. Really important. It also provides a place, a safe place. Like yesterday, we had a wedding in here. You guys would not recognize this room. Um, Dimitri and Lupa, who come here, they're from Kazakhstan as well. Their daughter was getting married and asked, hey, can we use the church? Can we, can we lease, rent the building, whatever you want to call it? And um, they turned this place into a ballroom, basically. All the chairs were covered with white linen and gold sashes. And it was out of Revelation 1. You're going to find out about it in just a second. It was fantastic. And it was just beautiful. And food, so much food. So now I'm not going to eat for a month, right? And But... Everybody that came into this room was like, this room feels so good. We like it here. We like this room. And that's because we give and we invest into this place so we can have a place where our community can come and feel the presence of God. Some people don't even know it's the presence of God that they sense in this place, but it is the presence of God. And he just doesn't dwell here with us. He dwells in us. Important for us to know that. You don't, you don't need to, go, I need to go find Jesus. I need to go be in that building. No, he's with you. So spend time with him. Focus on him. Plug in. Pull up, pull, unplug from other things and plug into him. It's really good. Really important. How many consumers do we have in the room? Really, should, all, of us, all of us should have our hands up. Yeah, it was a trick question, Tony. So... So Tony's not very happy this morning because my wife took his spot in church. So, so, so they're going to have a little mediation. Someone, some, Miranda can be the mediator afterwards and they can talk it out. So, we didn't see a sign, Tony, so you might need to come up with a little gold plaque. Okay. We're all consumers. And so I got to thinking taglines, like slogans this week. And how many of us, uh, we see one, it just automatically comes back, even if we haven't seen it for a long time. You know, advertising agencies are spent, are paid millions, even billions of dollars to come up with these taglines that we will never forget. What is that? that yeah, of course, it's Nike. Hey, I had to be equal. I mean, I had to do men and women here. L'Oreal is correct. <laughs> Fiona, because you're worth it. L'Oreal. Bet you can't eat just one. What? Someone said McDonald's, but someone else said? Lay's potato chips. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Bounty. Bounty. Very good. Very good. I'm impressed with your consumerism. Okay. So on the way to church this morning, uh, Heather asked me, hey, so what did you learn this week as you were studying? And um, this is one of the things I learned. I didn't know AOL stood for America Online. 
I was just like AOL. I remember when AOL first came out. It was kind of at the same time that um, there's a big, huge superstore that opened up in Auburn. Uh, something Universe. What was it called? No, it wasn't Walmart. <laughs> Incredible Universe was this huge store, and it was kind of one of the first of its kind where you walked in and they sold everything, um, like electronic. It was massive. And they were handing out AOL CDs that you can take home and put in your personal computer, and you could go online. Oh, they might, yeah, they might, you guys, well, I'm not dating you guys. I mean, do you, if you guys want to go floppy disk, you guys go floppy disk. I had a CD, thank you very much. So. It wasn't a cassette, it was a CD. Um, and it got me thinking of these whole taglines. Now, I looked at these headlines just randomly this week and just picked out five of them. But I, you know what? This is a side note. I can see Jesus in all of these headlines. Can't you just see Jesus saying, wait, will you just do it? <laughs> Jesus came. We already talked about it. Why did he come? Because we're worth it. <laughs> so, so here's my hit. So listen. Psalm says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And when we do that, there's nothing like being with Jesus. Now, the Bible also says that we can taste and like, eh, and choose our own way. But when we really taste and see, you can't just have a little bit of Jesus. Jan pulled me aside right before service and prayed for me. And she says, I pray that Kevin's shoes would be squeaky because of just the living water flowing out of him. I was like, that is a cool image. I'm just going to squeak around because I got so much Jesus. But that's once we taste and see that he is so good. And when we fall, what does he do? He is the quicker picker-upper. He will pick us up and put us and dust us off and say, just do it. Just keep going. Just keep going. We've got mail. Here's the... You've got mail, right? You remember that? You've got mail. Every time you open up your computer and this little voice came on, you want me to do it again? <laughs> You've got mail, okay? So I've been spending time, a lot of time with Jesus. I, I do that often. And I've been asking him, God, where do you want to lead us as a church? Because I don't go online to sermons.com, which is a thing, and resource, pastoralresources.com, who have all these sermons and studies that I can just click on and then like, okay, we're going to do this. I asked Jesus, what are we going to do? Where do you want to take us? Where are we going? And he said, we've got mail. Letters to the churches, to the church. And where are those letters found? Specifically, the letters to the church from Jesus directly are found in Revelation. And as soon as I saw Revelation, I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> Jesus, let's do something else. Let's do eat something easy like James. No. So we're going to look at the letters that Jesus spoke to John in the book of Revelation. There are seven churches. We're going to get into all that. And so it's easy for us to get distracted. And I'm going to talk a lot about that. When we read the book of Revelation, it's really easy to do the squirrel thing. Like, squirrel? And the main point is here, and we're like running around looking at these little things over here, all the shiny things. And so as we go through this book, this is what I've been praying. I'm just going to share my prayer, prayer request before you, that we would take these letters to heart. 
that they wouldn't just be stories, it just wouldn't be something that we're reading, but we'd actually really take them to heart. That we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us, yes, individually, personally, but also as his church. That we take an open and honest look at where we are with him, both personally and as the church. And I pray that these letters would inspire us, that they would encourage us that they would correct us. Yes, I do pray that. If I'm off in my relationship with Jesus, I want to know. I don't want to be off with him. I want to be on with him. I want to be squeaking as I walk because I'm so close with him. And that's what I want for us as a church. I want his word to guide us. And I want Jesus' words to his church to comfort us as well. We are walking in really interesting times right now. I know every generation says it. Every pastor says it. I'm saying it again. It is really interesting out there right now. And people need to know about Jesus. They don't need to know about all the shiny, frilly stuff. They need to know what's in your hand. Jesus came to save me. Well, what did you need saved from? Well, I was really broken. This is how I was broken. And he can, he can save you, and he can heal your heart. He can work in you as well. And so let's, let's talk about that. Anybody go through the Try Praying book? Okay. Yeah. It's a powerful little book. That book's not for you to keep and hang on to. That book is for you once you've read it a couple times, you've prayed through it, that book is for you to give it away to somebody. But don't just like throw it. Don't leave it, don't leave it for your server as a tip. Please don't do that. <laughs> Unless you throw a $50 bill in it. A real one, not one of those fake track ones. Okay? But talk to somebody about it. Hey, I read this book. And this is what God was doing in me as I read this book. And what I do is I want to give it to you, and I pray that he would do things in your life as well. And some of you are like, I will never have that conversation with somebody. We need two people. And even if you're an introvert, you need to. Jesus didn't say, hey, extroverts, go and make disciples. He told the church, go and make disciples. We did a survey here, and pretty much 80% introvert, 20% extrovert. Or maybe it was actually 95% introvert, but the 5% sounded like 20%. Okay? Think about the group of people Jesus was saying those words to before he ascended into heaven. It was a group of his disciples and his followers, and it was probably the same ratio. Probably 80%, like, oh, man. And then there's Peter. He made up the 20%, Right? So these are my prayers, that we would take these letters to heart, that we would allow the Holy Spirit to really speak to us, that you wouldn't just listen to my words on the Sunday morning and just leave it, but then you would go out throughout your week, and as we break into these letters, we're going to get into it next week. We're going to do something really easy today. We're going to cover Revelation 1 in about 25 minutes. I, I hear the Mission Impossible music in, my back, in the background. We're going to read Revelation 1, and as we read it, I'm going to try to answer five questions as we read and talk about Revelation 1 this morning. What is Jesus' message? Who are these letters to? Who are the letters from? Why are we getting the letters? And who is John, anyways? Who is this guy named John? So you need a Bible? Raise your hand. We're going to hand out Bibles this morning. I encourage you to um, actually read it right out of the Word. If you don't have a Bible with you, we have them for you. But you also, there's some great Bible apps as well. I'm actually reading out of the NIV version. That's what kind of we do here at the church, even though I study out of all kinds of different, different ones to find out what the different root words are and stuff like that. But Revelation chapter 1.
I know you came to church just to hear me read, but we're going to read it, and then we're going to jump in and try to answer some questions this morning. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loves us who has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all on the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that is ours in Jesus, was on, an island, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was like wool, white wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. The hair on his head was, oh, I just said that. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace, and his voice was like the sounding of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp, a sharp double-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet, and so did. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later, the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and in the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we can read this passage, and we really should take another two months to cover Revelation 1 instead of 23 minutes. Well, wait a minute, you said 25 minutes ago, like five minutes ago. Yeah, that's how my clock works. Okay. So you have, when you come to church, you have to dial into my watch. And guess what? I don't wear one. <laughs> okay, anyways. It's easy to read this passage and like, I want to talk about the seven lampstands. I want to talk about what Jesus looked like when he showed up. Now, there's an angel that shows up in Revelation 1 that brings a message, but then 
when John is describing when he's out on an early morning Sunday walk while he's in prison, Jesus appears to him. And it's not the hippie Jesus' best friend, Jesus, that a lot of us view. This is Jesus, the Almighty, who stands before John. Easy to get caught up in all those things. But even Jesus himself says in this passage is, I've got a message for you. I need you to do what I'm telling you to do. Listen, I am God, and I'm telling you these things because I love you, because I care for you, and I want to keep you on track. Because the kingdom of God is near. Things are going to start happening, Jesus said. And this is a long time ago. Now just imagine how it's escalated. All the interest, if you're into investing, all the interest over all these years, now it's just spinning like this. And we're starting to see God begin to wrap, start wrapping things up as we look out and see what's happening in our world. Who is this letter written to? Well, first of all, what is the message of this letter? The first part. Jesus says, I'm telling you this stuff because things are going to start happening. And he encourages us, like, you need to pay attention to what's going to happen, what's happening in this letter. Then he also, it's interesting, he gets into this passage right here where, where, the, where the message says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take heart what is written in it, because the time is near. And I love the, the New Living Translation, how it puts it, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. And he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. One of the things that we struggle with as followers of Jesus is we're pretty good of listening to what he has to say. We have it right here. This is what he has to say. And he's laid it out for us pretty clearly. Our struggle is with the hearing and the doing. Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what I tell you to do. Francis Chan, if you're familiar with him, um, love his teachings. He's a, he's a very real. Um, some of the things that he's done, I mean, he left his mega church to go disciple people uh, in San Francisco on the streets because God told him to do it. He had a church of three or 4,000 people, and just God says, no. Nope. That time is done for you. I want you to go down to City Impact, and I want you to meet in the mission, and I want you to disciple men one-on-one. -on -one. And so that's what he started doing, and he's doing stuff all around the world. Uh, he speaks at big conferences and stuff, but he tells a story about his teenage daughter, and he told her to go clean her room. Pretty clear. Go clean your room before you go hang out with your friends. So about an hour later, he walks in, and she's just sitting there. Her room's not clean. He said, didn't I ask you to, not just ask you, but I told you to go clean your room. Why didn't you do that? Well, Dad, I listened to what you said. I even wrote it down. I highlighted it. I circled it. I starred it. But he just turns to his daughter and says, I need you to do it. And that's where sometimes we fall short. We fail to do what Jesus asked us to do. So what are we supposed to do then as followers of Christ? 
Everything is summed up, Jesus says, in two things. Love God, and not just like God. Love him to the point you put him first in everything that you do. That means with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we're supposed to love one another. Jesus says, love your neighbor. And we're like, who's our neighbor? And Jesus says, your neighbor is the person that you don't like. It's the Samaritan is your neighbor. And the Samaritans aren't people they didn't like. In fact, they hated the Samaritans. And Jesus said, they're your neighbors. Love people, Jesus said. Love God and love people. That's what we're supposed to be doing, church. And then as the church, as we come together, yes, we're supposed to come together. We're supposed to read the Bible together. We're supposed to fellowship together. We're supposed to pray together and encourage one another to love our neighbors and to continue to love God. That's the word spur one another on. So Jesus writes this message to us, gives this message to John. And I have often thought about, when you think about Revelation, especially the letters to the churches, you know, you get a letter in the mail, or someone says, hey, can we get together and talk? Usually my first inclination is, I'm in trouble. What did I do now? They want to meet with me because they're angry with me. I'm getting this letter, and it's a red letter. The envelope is red or pink or whatever. This is not good. That's my first inclination. A lot of times when we look at Revelation, the letters to the churches, we think we're in trouble. But the message from Jesus is simply this. Grace and peace. That's how he starts off the letter. Now, he's going to get very real. Jesus is going to personalize these letters to us. It's not junk mail. It's not just one carpet letter that just shows up in your mailbox, and you you stand there, and you just literally... Who does this? I get my mail, and I stand by the garbage can, and I just drop whatever I know. It's just junk mail. Like, you didn't send that to me. It says my name on it. You spelled it wrong, but it has my name on it. It's not to me. It's just whoever wants to read it, right? But these letters that we're going to read are personal letters to the church. It's personal. The letters are written to the church, the church is. And here's a map. So it's currently, these churches are in the country of Turkey right now. And so you can see, and I'm not going to say them in order because I don't have it memorized in order of the letters. I know Ephesus is first, okay? Well, Ephesus, I think Smyrna. Well, I don't know. Ephesus is first. How's that? I know that. And I know the third one is Pergamos or Pergamum, because Rick's going to be sharing on that in a few weeks. But we have Ephesus, we have Smyrna, Laodicea, Philadelphia. Well, I thought that was, oh no, that's, that's where it's at right there. Sardis, Thyatira, and then Pergamos, Pergamum. That's who these letters are written to. They're written while John was in prison. And why was John in prison? He was in prison simply because of the gospel. They put him in jail because he was preaching the good news of Jesus. And the leaders at the time didn't like it. And so they put him in jail for it. And they secluded him to an island. And if you kind of see it, it's kind of out in the, right, right there, that little island. It's Patmos. It's basically a rock. It's kind of like Alcatraz. Anybody been to Alcatraz? It's just a rock. And that's, John was in prison there. The letters were written to the churches about 96 AD. So Jesus had been gone from planet Earth 
about 60 years, 60 plus years. Many of the apostles at this point had already been put to death. John was boiled in oil and then put in prison. And there's different stories historically. The Bible doesn't say, but these guys were real people. So there's history about these men and women. Some say it was a miraculous thing. They, to, to torture John, they just dipped him in hot burning oil. Anybody ever cook bacon? And you get one little pop on your arm and you're like, I'm going to the hospital. <laughs> and some say that John, they dipped him in oil and it's kind of like the Daniel thing and the fiery furnace or at the lion's den that just nothing happened. They pulled him back out and he was fine. Some say that he, he suffered burns and they put him out. We, we don't know for sure. But what we do know is that he, was, he suffered for the sake of the gospel. He actually says it in here. The letters were written, like I said, 96 AD, and they're written about 26 years after the fall of Jerusalem. Jesus predicted in Matthew that Jerusalem would fall. It's a double prophecy because some of the things are still yet to come. But the fall of Jerusalem did happen about 70 AD when Nero himself basically, he burned the city down. And then guess who he blamed? He blamed the Christians. And so persecution showed up big time on the Christians. So what did they do? They scattered. And a bunch of them ended up in this region here and started churches. Sometimes we have to go through difficult times to do what Jesus is asking us to do. To so we'll scatter and get away from our comfort zone and like, okay, I need to step over here then. And like I said, this wasn't junk mail. Every letter was personalized by Jesus himself to the churches. Which answers the question, who are these letters from? These letters are from Jesus himself to his church. In verses 4 through 8, we won't take the time to read through, read through those again. But just simply it says, these letters are from the one who offers true grace and peace. These letters are from the risen one, the ruler of all, from the one who has freed us from sin. These letters were given to us and to remind us that we have been placed in the kingdom of God. These letters were written so we would know that he and he alone is worthy of all glory, praise, power. And verse 8, let's read verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Alpha and the Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, meaning that Jesus is saying, I'm the beginning and I'm the end. I'm the finality is the word. I love that. A lot of us, we fear what's next. We fear kind of the final. Jesus is the finality. If he's the final, then that's, I don't have to worry about it because when my final shows up, he's there. He's the finality of life. He's always going to be, always. Basically, when it says who was and is and is to come, all those phrases, basically what if modern translation, or if Abraham was, or Moses was translating this, it says, I am, I am, I am. Love it. So why are we getting these letters? I kind of describe that sometimes we have this mindset that, well, I'm getting these letters because I'm in trouble. The church is in trouble. Church wasn't in trouble. The church was kind of getting off track. The church was trying too hard. The church was making up stuff. We have all we need right here. We don't need to make up stuff. We don't need to add to it. 
And we're going to get into that when we get into the, 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 the separate letters, the personalized letters. What are some of the stuff that they were making up? Well, one of the things real quickly was that Jesus isn't enough. Then you need to work for your salvation. You need to earn your salvation. Jesus isn't enough. And the bottom line is Jesus is enough. If all you have is Jesus, that's all you need. The thief on the cross, all he had was Jesus. The guy never went to a Bible study. He was never baptized. He didn't have church attendance. And yet when he showed up in heaven and they asked him, why are you here? Alistair Beggs has a great sermon on this. He says, the man on the middle of the cross told me I could come. That's all he knew. I mean, he's on a cross next to Jesus. He couldn't look up and see that it said, King of the Jews. Truly, he was the king. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. He didn't know that. All he knew was the guy on the middle cross invited me to come. So we're getting these letters because he loves us. Because he set us free from our sin. We're getting these letters because we're stuck. The church was stuck in some areas. And here's the thing. As I look at the whole us being stuck, Jesus in Matthew 5 says that we are the light of the world. We're like a city on a hill. We cannot be hidden. If we have him, we're just light. And you realize that light never gets stuck. Light always finds a way. We can have this room dark, and we can have one little crack somewhere up around here, like right here, I can see it up in there. We're trying to keep the darkness out of this room with that shade. And yet, the smallest little spot, light will always find a way. That's why we're getting these letters, because he wants to remind us that we are light, and we are supposed to be lit up so people know the way. So who is John? John. Well, many of us, if you grew up in church, if you've been a believer for a while, we know a lot of this stuff. And honestly, as I prepare these messages, I love you. But I'm not necessarily preaching these messages just to you. I mean, I want you to get something, of course. I trust the Holy Spirit is speaking to your hearts as we read his word, as I share kind of the, what, I, what he's been giving me. But I'm sharing a lot of this stuff for those of you that don't know. You didn't grow up in church. You don't really know. Well, who is John? Well, let's talk about it. John is the writer of the book of Revelation. But he also wrote three other little books called First, Second, and Third. John. Yay, John. He also wrote the Gospel of... Yeah, it'd be weird if you wrote the Gospel of Matthew, but yeah, John. John was one of Jesus' best friends. Well, I thought Jesus said, everybody is Jesus' friend. That is true. Jesus welcomed all. Jesus had 12 disciples and lots of, well, 12 apostles. Disciples was what they called them at the time. But he had lots of disciples, men and women. A lot of women follow Jesus that is acknowledged in the, in the Bible. John was close to Jesus. John would describe himself in his own Gospels as the disciple that Jesus loved. Well, that's pretty cocky. <laughs> but you know, every single one of us can say, Jesus loves me, and that's not a selfish phrase. Like, if you said Jesus loves me, I'm not going to argue with you and say, no, wait a minute, he loves me. Yes, he does love you, he does love me. And John is humbled by God's grace and said, in spite of me being a son of thunder, look it up, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved anyways. They were best friends. They hung around a lot. Him and Peter and John's brother James hung around a lot. 
John's brother James would be the first one who would die for their faith out of the apostles. John had seen Jesus in his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. But this time when he sees Jesus on, this, on the island of Patmos, it is a little bit different. I mean, it's recorded in three of the Gospels, and if you read them, and every single one has a different perspective. And one of them has the same response. They were terrified and they fell to the ground. But in this case, when, when John is in the Spirit, I love that description, that he is like focused, intentionally walking in the Spirit, praying, focused with his eyes on Jesus. And he hears this loud voice, and he turns around and he sees Jesus. But not Jesus in his physical body, but Jesus in his heavenly body. Jesus as the Almighty. And John tries to describe him. His like hair was like snow. He was like glowing. Everything was so bright about who he was. And it scared me so much, I fell to the ground as if I were dead. And Jesus' response was not like, yes, you must worship me. That's the best I can do, people. Sorry. I should have Ben Garcia do that because he, he can nail that. His response was, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I have a message that I want to speak to you and through you. John was the, the guy that Jesus trusted with his own mom. Back then, culturally, that was a huge deal to be entrusted. Well, moms were a huge deal. Parents were a huge deal in their society. They just didn't do sometimes what we do, and we just forget about them. We just leave them. They were honored. They were priceless. And so when Jesus is dying on the cross, John is down. John's the only disciple, apostle, that actually went to the cross and a witness was at the foot of the cross. He was with Mary. And Jesus, while dying on the cross, looks at John and said, John, take care of my mom. Mom, he's going to take care of you. So John is trusted. And so God, in his sovereignty, trusts John to take this message and to give it to the church. And so as we studied over the next several weeks, there's seven letters, so how many times are we going to talk about it? We're going to do it seven times, and then we'll have a wrap-up. So actually eight times. John was a man who was imprisoned for his faith and has an incredible encounter with Jesus, and he tells us about it. As we look at the letters to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos or Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, Again, I pray that they would inspire us, encourage us, correct us, guide us, and comfort us. Let's stand together. Now, I have two questions this morning as we wrap up. And again, it's... These are personal questions. So do you see Jesus for who he is? And we have to take the entirety of the scriptures and not just pull little passages here and there. Yes, Jesus came to save us. Yes, Jesus walked with us. Yes, Jesus showed extreme compassion to people and to us. But Jesus is fully God. He is the Almighty. We need, as followers of Him,
to have an awe and wonder of who he is. Not out of fear. Because what, did, what was his response to John? He said, don't be afraid. But we need to have this incredible, like, Jesus, you are the beginning and the end. You are the one who rules all, in charge of all, including me. And so, Jesus, I want to honor you for who you are, with how I live, how I follow you. It's important to know him. And the other question is, where are you at with him today? I mean, in the Try Praying book, it just keeps coming back to me over and over. There's a phrase, and I forget what day it was. I think it was day four. And I said, are you the one who just likes to hang around with Jesus? Or do you really follow him? Do you really listen to him? Do you actually obey him? It's easy to hang around with Jesus. Because when I'm done hanging out, I can just leave. But when we truly follow him, we don't just leave. We actually follow him. We actually do what he asks us to do. We are obedient to him. And I don't, we, we don't always talk about obedience, but Jesus said it, so it's okay for us to say it. If you love me, you'll obey me, Jesus said. And I'm talking to Christians here. Christian, I'm talking to you. Where are you at with him? Are you just hanging out with him? Or do you really follow him in your daily walk? I mean, like every day. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, the invitation is to know him as the Almighty. He has everything in control. He is the beginning and the end. I just want to simply ask you those questions today. Do you see Jesus for who he is? And where are you at with Jesus today? And Lord, as we ask these questions as to ourselves, Lord, I would just pray for just a moment of true honesty. Lord, I pray for the heart of repentance for those of us, for me, for those of us that are kind of doing our own thing. That we'd come back to you. That we wouldn't just hang out with you whenever we want, but we would actually, that our shoes would squeak with your presence that the living water that flows through us would be so evident to us, yes, but to others as well. Lord, that, God, that we would know you. And I know for me personally, Lord, what settles my spirit in the midst of uncertain times is that you see us. And your word says multiple times, do not be afraid. I am the finality of it all. And so, Lord, we put our trust in you. We put our hope in you. Pray for everyone who is at home watching this morning, Lord God, that you administer to the depths of their heart. And I pray the same thing for those of us in this room, that you administer to the depths of our heart, that we would take your word to heart, and we would do it. And we would just do it. In your name. And the church said? Amen. Amen. All right, we're in the book of Ephesus next week. You can read ahead. Go for it.